Hello, Javier. Thank you very much for sharing your time with me. It's always a pleasure. I will ask a few questions and let's see how it goes. I'm pretty curious about a few things. Let's see, because I don't know any of them. Knowing you a little bit, I'm a bit uh, worried what you're going to be asking. <laughs> but let's see. <laughs> Good. So the first one is, can you describe a little bit your spiritual journey? Where to begin? I've never been asked this one. Say my spiritual journey starts at around eight years old. Been having some intense experiences, difficult to describe. My environment was really, didn't have the knowledge to explain or really to support me with what I was saying. <laughs> After like 40 years now, 30 something years or 40, I understand how shocking it must have been for them having your young child telling you that he's seeing things or feeling things that are not there or giving you information. Well, at that time we were growing, we didn't have internet. I grew up in a small island in Greece, in the south of Greece. We only had like two channels on the TV. There was so much information you could get. And I remember once I told my father, I was eight years old and I said, it was both of them. And I said, you have to teach me how to meditate. And uh, this word, was, they've never heard this thing, you know. So they say, where are you getting all this? What does that mean? Have you been reading the encyclopedia again? Because we had a big encyclopedia in the house. I said, no, no, but you have to teach me. You should do it, you know. And they said, we don't know what that is. Cut that nonsense. Because I was always coming up with things. I guess we are all spiritual from the moment we enter this world sometimes it clicks for one and other times for another but for me it clicked around that age and then as it happens with kids that do not have the support for these things it took me a good 15 years to come back to it growing up and going into adolescence and going crazy with everything and then at some point I don't know, around maybe 21 or 22, I started exploring a little bit because I had a deep interest into energy uh, and the energy surrounding us at that time. I didn't have a lot of knowledge in terms of spiritual schools or anything like that. So I started studying more and then experimenting, let's say, and slowly one thing led to another. But I'm guessing yeah, around that age, 21, 22 I really started a personal journey of exploration and it was with discovering energy in the beginning and then slowly meeting spiritual teachers and traveling and learning and it kind of goes on by and, itself after that. And slowly, slowly it became a priority in your life, or uh, a way, a way of living, let's say. In the beginning, it was more like a, a, my fun time because I was like, experimenting with energy a lot, traveling into sacred places, and I had my own ideas around that time and really doing things. Uh, but it was more like a hobby at that time, more like a way of enjoying more. And then slowly, slowly, it kind of became a way of life. I mean, I was always interested in arts, painting, music, and I was, well, one could say I was an artist in my time before this. Or I would say I'm still an artist, but it's a different type of, type of art, let's say, that I'm trying myself on. But at some point, it became so difficult to continue with both things uh, because I was into music and making movies. And then I thought, yeah, I will continue with what I love more and I loved uh, spirituality more. So I continued with that. And what does a spiritual mean to you? Spiritual is uh, being in contact with the world with your full capacity. This is what is spiritual for me, like touching the world as much as you can, the deeper you can imagine. This is it. A spiritual is not chanting mantras or only praying or just walking with your head up high uh, as a spiritual person should or whatever. Spiritual is really touching everything and everyone and yourself with kindness and love and the sense of awe and exploration. That's what it is for me. What does growth mean to you? Because we are talking sometimes about the spiritual growth, but we are growing. Well, 
You see, this could be a little bit tricky because in our deepest quality, let's say, in our core, we are fully grown. We are complete. Our light is shining and has been shining since it was created. But the problem is that the clothes we wear do not allow it. The body that brings us in this world does not allow us to see our light. So although we are fully grown, we are perfect beings of light, we do not see it. And we kind of identify with this body, with this life more. And it's, of course, logical. So we need to kind of, I would say, draw our steps back. So we're going back to our perfection. <laughs> it's not really going forward to anything. Just going back to what we know. This beautiful spiritual teacher, Kai Norbu, would always used to say, is not about finding something or discovering anything. It's all about getting in touch with your wisdom. We do not need to cultivate that. We do not need to make it stronger or brighter. We just need to... We had this conversation the other day and I said, it's just putting your hand in your pocket. You just put your hand in your pocket and you're there. You've finally arrived kind of thing, you know? It's about growing your awareness, maybe on about what you are. I know where you're going with the question, but I, I'm more philosophical. It's early. <laughs> it's early. <laughs> <stupid. laughs> yes, of course. Uh, it's about growing in awareness. It's about growing in compassion. It's about growing in love. It's about reconnecting with ourselves and our truth, our reality, and touching the world with honesty and, and really with, with our hands open and not defending and not trying to get somewhere, really. The best strategy so for emotional growth? Oh, there are so many. You said the emotional growth? First emotional and then a spiritual I guess it's something that it's connected as a normal path is not to just try to deal with your emotions and then keep on growing on spiritual. How do you see it? These things going really together, mind, body and spirit in that sense, or better soul should be going together. They are together anyway. It's only that in our understanding, we are kind of dividing them or we can touch a little bit here and a little bit there. We are kind of growing irregularly, like some of the weird plants in the garden that don't really make it. Like they grow a branch there and trying to find the light and the branch there, and then the, the soil is not so good for them. And we are growing like this in that sense. But if we are to address it as an emotional growth, I would say just being really in contact with our emotions, first of all. This is a good thing. And touching the emotions and reconnecting them with the body. This hides a lot of truth in it. A lot of our personal history and limitations and our traumas and so on. So a good idea is to try and touch again or to recreate this connection of the emotions, the mind and the body. And this would really change things in your world. The more you really start to connect with the body and you put on top of that the emotions and all this aspect of our pulsation, of life and of ca our calculation of the world as it's hitting us. And then the mind on top of everything is like an amazing cake of consciousness. In this kind of union, then we really, really grow. And it's not emotional. In that sense, again, it's spiritual. We are all, always growing in spirit, but we're, let's say, growing in different areas, trying to catch the light. I would say that the imperative thing is making this reconnection of mind, body, and emotions, and then kind of the personal history flows, and you have to address it, of course. <laughs> you have to go to therapy, and you have to work with all of these things, and there you have it. Now you are really breathing, let's say. It's pretty much the same not for a spiritual growth. They're connected. There's not boundaries between them. As I was saying, I think they're kind of together in this game. The more this first game is being acted out of reconnection, uh, then the more we are seeing different things in our world that are kind of beyond ourselves. The more we discover ourselves, we are discovering the reality of what surrounds us. And the reality of what surrounds us is a mystery. It's really a beautiful game of guessing and experiencing. It's always clouded with this beauty, but then revealed by beauty.
at the same time. Once you really start to unlock yourself on this level, on this body, mind, emotional level, then the world kind of starts to appear. I remember, really, I was once, and you can call these experiences with many names. I was once on a plane. So I was giving a seminar, actually, in Spain and returning. It's one of these things that you have to take three or four different planes. And by the end of the day, you're like a wreck, you know, <laughs> arriving. But I remember the plane going down, and I was seeing the sea. And the waves were like receiving the power of the wind. And you could see like windy waves kind of thing. When I put it in my diary, it's like, remember the windy waves. <laughs> but it was a moment of really reconnecting with this grandeur, this total the flow that encompasses everything and is in everything. And that was not only the sea and the sun and the wind. It was everything, everything together. And they were working all together in such a unison, such a, a nice concert. And this blew my mind. Uh, although I've I had experience in the past, but it was one of these things that really, on a very simple, simple level, it kind of slaps you in the face. Why haven't you been seeing all that? <laughs> And it's always our limitations. It's always our personal thing. Yeah. Spirituality is there, but it needs to reveal itself when we are more free to see and really grow in this connection that it starts as beauty and then it becomes the mystery of grace and the mystery of reconnecting with God, with the Buddhas, with the angels and so on. I always like to keep it kind of real, let's say kind of realistic <laughs> as you can in this spiritual journey and i think the more you use this simple kind of way of seeing things the more it reveals itself i see also another very like grounded way of looking at this is also neurosis because it's repressed emotions you need energy to repress those emotions. When you're more in touch with those emotions and you don't need to just kind of love them, you have more energy. So more energy means more consciousness. And that's part of a very logical path of evolving. Sure. Although it doesn't happen exactly like this, when our, say, limitations or our neurosis are hiding this energy or this light, it's better to consider it like this. We have a wisdom that's been kept or kind of shelled in these neurotic patterns or experiences. And then when you work with them, this light kind of pops out. But in the beginning, imagine an explosion from the inside, something like this. And it's really sending the shells of the egg or, or this cover of the neurosis everywhere. So in the beginning, everything is contaminated with this energy. It is an awakening, but it's... Well, looking at it from afar, it's horrible. <laughs> because of all the fragments of, of this neurotic energy are going everywhere. Uh, I like this phrase that if an egg is broken from the outside, life stops. And if an egg is cracked from the inside, life begins. And it's a nice way of seeing it. We have to be responsible for our process in that sense. And the more we grow, in this uh, in this level of breaking the neurotic patterns and releasing that light, then the focus is on the light. But what I'm saying is that the neurotic energy is contaminating a little bit the experience in the beginning. It's not just energy, oh, and the angels are singing. <laughs> and wonderful, we went through that stuff. Uh, so in the beginning, it's a little bit trying to find the balance, but then yes, we do have a surplus of light or energy in our experience. And we can distinguish better and we have more energy to use in our daily life. And in that sense, that is the fuel that keeps everything going because you need courage and you need the energy and you need the clarity to keep on going in this path. And of course, as it evolves, you have to develop other qualities like compassion and understanding and a sense of humbleness to continue growing safely. You say that uh, if you have a catharsis, you view and block some emotions. I thought that that energy goes to the flow. So it seems like you need some time to readjust the, your whole experience. We don't usually share these things <laughs> from the first class, let's say. What happens is, imagine it like this shell or one of our teachers, Carlos de Leon, describes it as capsules of energy that are holding it. It's nice, this idea of a capsule, that when it breaks, when it opens, it's releasing the light, but also 
the capsule is kind of fragmenting and it's polluting the experience in the beginning. So what will happen a person if they're breaking like a complex or a neurotic pattern in this way? In the beginning, they will experience some sensations that are not very pleasant, like fear or anger or some sense of kind of losing ground in their experience. There's a good reason for all of that, because we are attached to our complexes, to our neurosis. And this attachment, although not healthy, it creates a kind of sense of security. This is what we know to be okay. Not great, but okay. Uh, so... When this shell of the neurosis that has been our security, our home, uh, until this time breaks, then, oh my God, <laughs> it's like, what is happening to me? Fear and strange emotions start appearing because we're losing our balance and we're losing our safety, our security. But this is only in the beginning. So this is what we're talking about in terms of the fragmentation that is created. And then the flow is stronger, the light is stronger, and you just stay and these things find their new place. But in the beginning, people will experience certain things like that. And it's okay. Imagine like somebody been closed in a house all your life. You haven't been outside. And then somebody grabs you by the hand and says, come, 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 let me show you. And then just close your eyes. And then you go out and you immediately, you're in a huge space. Space is what you will experience when neurosis is released or dealt with, let's say, more space to understand yourself and the experience. And then you're in a huge space and there is light and there's not the safety of the four walls and you're exposed somehow. So this is what we're feeling. But then who wants to stay inside the house on a sunny day? Mm -hmm. Not yeah. me. <laughs> but something that I think is very important for people to understand, it happens in several health processes that there's like a health crisis. No? It's the dark night of the soul, what we say sometimes. I you mean, sometimes need to deal with a little bit worse moments to get better again. And sometimes when people, they are getting in touch with that, they feel that they are not doing the right thing. Sure. And this is an issue because in our society, we have kind of blocked any negative emotions. Everything that is not a feel-good thing, then it's kind of, oh, no, 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 that's not for me. I know, but I don't want to touch it. Or it's not good to touch it. Like somebody cries and you go, no, no, don't cry, don't cry, please don't cry. Here's a, a thing to wipe you. When people come in sessions with me and they cry, I say, please cry. Please, it's good that you're crying, finally. Something that people do is that they cry and they pick up the handkerchief and it's like they don't allow the tears to run. So, I mean, come on, you're crying, accept it. <laughs> At least that, you know, it's happening. So, we are not uh, trained to accept negative emotions or negativity in that sense, but this is the light that has been hidden. It's not negativity, it is our learning that is waiting there. So it's like you have to go through all the impurities and find that. Because we are not taught that it's okay to deal with the negativity, that somebody else would deal with the negativity, and we are grown kind of safely and securely and with love and so on, tucked away from the troubles of the world, then at some point where some of us will go to therapy and we start facing these things, it's like, oh, my God, there's anger here. I don't want to be angry. I was better before. I was a little sad or didn't know what was happening, but now I'm angry or now I'm really sad or I'm afraid. And these things are perfect. This is a wonderful way of touching what we haven't been touching all our lives. And it will not be an intense emotion or an intense experience always. No, not at all. But we have to touch it. We have to see it. It's part of our reality. It's like you're putting stuff in a storage room. We all have our little storage rooms or cupboards or weird places that we store things. There comes a point when it's full. And in the beginning, you were opening and putting that, and that's okay. There is space. And after a while, you kind of open it. Like, things come down. <laughs> hmm. And it's one of these things. There comes a point where we have to address the full closet of our negativity, you know, the filled closet of our negativity. In therapy, we do, this is what we do, but we do it in a gradual way, in a secure way, in a safe way. And the only thing that we need is a little bit of honesty, a little bit of courage to say, yeah, man, I've been angry in the past, this and that happened, and I'll deal with it. Finally, it's a good time to see all that, or I've been rejected and never gave any point to that, and I've been feeling rejected since that until today. So these experiences are limiting us. 
is not that they're sitting there and everything is fine. There is a, a hidden limitation or a subtext playing always that is sending information in terms of that. Neuroses are, are like, let's say, pieces of dirt or garbage in our free flow of, of energy, of this clean river of our life force. So at some point it comes that they all kind of get together and they block the flow. And it's the time when the storage room is full <laughs> and you have to address it. You have to kind of open, pick up, or what is this? Oh, this is resentment for blah, blah, blah. Okay, let's deal with this one. It sounds okay. Okay, then more space, take more and more. And that's how, that's how we work really. It is important to have a good therapist, to trust the process, to have a good group that you're working, trust God, life, <laughs> and so on. And it will become an experience of joy. Really, at but, the end, it's an experience of joy. Why would you say that is the purpose of emotions? I understand that we are trying to avoid emotions because it's something that we believe that is something very painful or we have like this non very rational uh, belief that we are going to die if we allow ourselves to feel. What is the purpose of emotions and why if we are blocking, we are just kind of blocking their meaning? No? Well, uh, you see that the thing with emotions first of all, is that we identify too much with them. Uh, one of the classic mistakes is you're feeling anger and you're saying, I'm angry. Yes, you are angry, but you're feeling anger. I am, the I am is very strong as a, you know, a foundation because we are addressing the core of being, I am. In spirituality, these two little words mean everything. <laughs> so... You are addressing the core of your being with a fleeting thing. It's no good practice for me. So you're saying, I am angry. No, you're feeling angry. I'm feeling angry, yes. Or I'm feeling anger, yes. But not I am angry. So first one is this. We identify too much. And then when you identify too much, <clears throat> then it's difficult to deal with them properly, honestly. Really what emotions do on a very mechanical level, they are mechanisms of releasing tension. Tension is built up in the body. The body is charging or charged with something. And then there is a need of discharging, of releasing, because this is the natural flow of things, this pulsation that exists in the world and in our bodies. So we charge with something and there needs to be some kind of release. So this release is taken over by some mechanics. We call it the mechanics of creation. And this mechanism now is trying to figure out a way for the best decompressing of the system. There is something happening, tension, whatever. And now this mechanism awakes and says, okay, we need to release that tension. We need to discharge that tension. This is now being addressed to the department of emotions. <laughs> and according to our history, what we've lived until now, one of these emotions will take the role and say, okay, okay, I will open up this thing for discharging. So there are really tricks for releasing tension and discharging and bring the body to a state of homeostasis, a state of relaxation. The trick also in this kind of mechanism of choosing which emotion is that really <clears throat> it could have been anything. If I cry, it could have been because I'm happy. You see, many people are happy and they cry. And many people are sad and they cry. What is happening with this crying? There's something wrong here. Or you, you see a person crying and they're happy. You say, but why are you crying? It's because I'm so happy. And you're thinking, well, it's a bit weird. It could be jumping. Because in our experience, this mechanism... We've, we've used it a lot, and the body has learned that it's helpful to use this type of decompression. Then we cry, or we are angry, and or whatever it is. So this is the part that is connected with our personal history, how we've learned to use these mechanisms. And now this is one of the reasons why it becomes very personal, because it's connected with our history. Every time that you've cried, and let's say you're a person that decompresses through crying, every time that you've cried, it has left a sense of release or relief after it. And it's connected a little bit with your way of seeing life or what you have experienced so far. So it fits you. 
and it works as a mechanism for decompressing, but also fits to describe your life. And that's why we say, I am sad in the end, or why it has some kind of truth in it. But for me, no, no, no. When we are working with it, I say, okay, forget the I am, leave the I am for the meditation room, <laughs> and we focus on the sadness. This clears it up a lot. Also, yeah, it's a little paradoxical because the purpose, it's let us be well. It's about well-being and about love. It's all the mechanism that we have to just make us feel good. And we are blocking a very sophisticated way to make us feel good. It's kind exactly. of funny. Very well put. Uh, the, our bodies are uh, like machines of wisdom or made with complete wisdom. This is even better. They are made with complete wisdom. And we have to really trust. The first observation in terms of energy, energy channels and so on, were made by people who were really observing their bodies. They didn't only see energy or light or these things. They were really observing their bodies. And for example, in the channels of acupuncture, the meridians in Chinese medicine, we're thinking that, uh, oh, how do they end up with these lines that run through the body and connect the organs and so on and all this complex kind of thing? Because you touch in one point and another point gets affected. And these are kind of standard. There is like a network in our body that works in a kind of standard way. But these all come through observation, through this good seeing of our movement and of our energy and so on. So it's interesting how we evolve in that sense. We evolve through this observation of our bodies and our bodies have this wisdom and they inform us. Like, imagine this. Every time you go to bed and you go to sleep, there is the best mechanism of psychotherapy is switched on, which is the dreaming process. We go to bed and we sleep. Some sleep without dreams and just because they're so tired and they just hit the pillow and they, wake, they open their eyes and it's like they had a hangover. Like, oh my God, what happened last night? It's like this for them. And other people really experience dreams and go through them and really live this life at night. With dreams, it is the body's way of doing psychotherapy. So the unconscious is now creating symbols and it's bringing them to your reality. You are already in a different type of body, we say, when you dream. You are in your dream body. So consciousness gets transferred in a weird level of existence that we are not used to experiencing every day but this happens in dreams and now that the unconscious is sending information to this bridge that is this dream body with our conscious mind and it's feeding it and everything is symbolic and it's quick like one of the ways that we we can really grow is um, becoming conscious in dreams and with some work, especially if we are younger, this can happen quicker. We can really do therapy in our dreams, consciously do therapy when, while we're asleep. And it's the best therapy you'll ever receive. It's quick, it's to the point, there's no talking, there's no listening to strange people telling you their opinion about you or whatever. You don't have to hit pillows and all that. Maybe you do. After you wake up, maybe there's something left. But the process is amazing. The process is complete. So imagine, you know, we have everything in our bodies. The soul is there. The primordial light of the creator is there. Then we have these mechanisms of decompressing with emotions and everything. Let alone that these things can hold and move and think. And then you have this wonderful capacity of connecting with the divine, with the world. And of course, with our dreams and other worlds and our, our process of uh, calculating, experiencing the world deeper on a personal level and creating this personal connection with grace, some may say. We, mm. we are perfect machines. If you have any, let's say, doubts about the existence of God, just look at your body, how it works. And then this thing cannot be a process of evolution for me. I like to walk in the clouds, but uh, this is what I think anyway. Mm. Why do we suffer? <laughs> Well, uh, what to do? Eh? <laughs> we suffer because of ignorance, mainly. We don't get it. Most of the times we don't get it. That's why we suffer. Uh, but uh, there are different ways that you can suffer in that sense. This thing uh, Osho used to say that he likes to suffer in luxury. He likes to suffer in Paris. 
if it is for him to suffer. <laughs> <laughs> During the lockdown, uh, we all experienced a sense of uh, this holding back of our freedoms and, and so on. And I remember we were in our house and in Greece it was really severe. The measures that they took, you have to send a text message saying, I'm going there, or can I have permission to move from this place to the other place? It was like a coup, a military coup kind of thing. And I remember our house was kind of high in the mountain and we never felt it. <laughs> like people were really suffering. I would imagine myself being in the city would have been really weird, like not being able to come outside of your house or looking from the balcony to have a little bit uh, a view of the sky. But I remember we experienced it and we were kind of suffering also because we couldn't see our friends, but we were suffering in nature in that sense. So there are different ways to suffer and it has to do with your choices. <laughs> Karma, of course, and other things, like could be many factors that take part in all of that, but choices is the thing. Why we suffer? Why we suffer? Because you chose it. But why I came into this life? Because you made bad choices in the past. <laughs> so always it's choices, just to start from the base. But going back to this idea, we suffer because of our ignorance. Imagine if we knew or we had a, a deep experience of how well we are connected with grace and God and this environment that is holding us. There wouldn't be any need for anything. It would have been peace and love and rock and roll. But it's not like that. Why? Because we have lost this connection of our light. For example, in Hinduism, there is this idea that the world is created in this perfect way for us to experience by the divine. And then in order for this to work well, God is like a trickster or a young boy, I would say, because girls have a different sense of playing or their tricks are different. It could be like a young boy. He's creating all of this playground with love, with so much excitement and everything. And then he says, you know what? Let's close the eyes. <laughs> and he puts a thing in the eyes and close and you cannot see it. You're like going like this on the world. And in Hinduism, this is Maya. We say it's Maya Shakti. It's even like a, an energy of God in the world that is hiding the truth. That is hiding the real connection. If you can take off the blindfold, then it would be, oh my God, this is it, you know. But this is it. The whole process, let's say, is for us to consciously feel, enjoy. And when you know, you say, okay, it's an elephant. And then you can take out the, the blindfold and yeah, it's an elephant <laughs> or whatever it is, but really experience the created world, experience the grace, the beauty. And then at some point, you know, so you don't need to wear the blindfold anymore. You can remove it. You know the world, you have seen the world, you have grown in spirit or in communion with God, we say in Christianity. At that point, there's nothing hidden. Your light is my light and it's the light of the world. And now is what we say we become conscious in this game of the blindfold and we're guiding other people and saying, oh, turn left, turn left. <laughs> Somebody is seeing me. And these are teachers usually, our teachers that kind of say, maybe if you could turn right, you will find something new. With one of my teachers is always like cryptic. I ask him something and always he says, yes, no, do this. And he never says much, but says, right, right, left, left. He's kind of guiding, but I have to experience. And this is good, you know, we are participating in the game and some others know the game well. They've removed the blindfold and that's it. So you can either enjoy this blindfold game or you can be suffering, you can be really suffering. I cannot see, I cannot understand. Start with enjoying it and start with this sense of play and start with the sense of coming into more contact with things. Most of us are rushing to figure it out. And don't rush. Don't, don't do it quickly. Just go step by step and enjoy it. And this is how it reveals itself. And connect with this rushes thing about wanting to get uh, or figure it out. But I guess also it's about trusting the process and believing in the purpose of life with this expansion in love. Because... We suffer, I guess, because if we don't get what we want, we suffer. If we get what we don't want, we suffer. If we get what we want, we suffer because we fear that we're going to lose it. So it's somehow realizing that everything is part of a purpose that is higher. It's about expansion and it's just about trusting the process. What I believe that I need or I want, I'm always kind of right now suspicious about it. I believe 
with everything. I most of the times I don't get it, but I trust the process. And I think part of it is leading me to just suffer much less. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, trusting how things evolve, but also understanding that most of our like choices or our desires are neurotic. <laughs> they are not clear. <laughs> there could be always, so why do you want that? So why do you want this car? So why do you want to be there? Once I had this teacher in shamanism, and every time that I would say something, he would say, but why? But why? I said, because I, and why? And because blah, blah, blah. And why is that? And there's always a why, a why, of like a little child, why, why, why? And at the end, it's like, because I don't know. Good, he would say, you don't know nothing. And, and always he would drive me insane with this kind of questions eh? and reaching to the point that I don't know nothing. And let's start from there. And there he would teach me something. It's always this process of our neurosis kind of guiding us in the world. It's nice how you describe the different levels of you get something and it's not what you wanted. You get what you wanted and then you want something more or whatever, you know. And this process doesn't even need to happen. Some of my teachers, I've been observing them for years, decades, and even on personal time, not only going to teachings, but sharing time together. And their simplicity is amazing. I mean, the good ones, because there are some that are okay, but, but the good ones, their simplicity is amazing. And also do not fuss too much. They do not fuss so much for money, and they do not fuss so much for food, and they do not fuss so much for clothes or transportation or gold or whatever. You know, it's good if they receive it, but they, eh, okay, it's nice. Thank you. Put it in the pile with the food and the rest of the stuff, and where are my keys? Is this type of attitude of receiving life as it comes to you and being happy with what comes. There is this wisdom of trusting the process, give it this name, but I say trust what comes. There's always a learning or a teaching into that. And we always want to have it very specific. No, 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 just a bit on the right, a little bit to the left. There you are. Now do this, not exactly like that. Do it like this. And now I have it. Now I've found my way of receiving pleasure. And this is how we do with our bodies, for example, or how we do with our food and our houses and whatever. But it's, it should be really simpler than that. You go into a new house and you want to fix it and create it as you do in the perfect way. And instead of leaving it, you say, yeah. Maybe a plant would look good there. And maybe after a while you discover there's no light there. So, okay, maybe that way. And then, then maybe, hmm, I need a more comfortable pillow instead of bringing everything together and fixing it. And now it's fixed. So now what do we do? That's not the point. The point is life. The point is living. The point is experiencing. Not satisfying only the need. But you see, life is always pulsating. Life is coming at you. It's like... One of the things I love is surfing, although now I cannot do much of it, but there's a huge knowledge into the, the sea or the ocean. Whatever you do, the waves will keep on coming. Catch this wave or that way. It doesn't matter. There'll be another one coming. <laughs> there will be another one shortly. No need to fuss about things. Or also this immensity of the different expressions. All waves are different. Mm -hmm. They all kind of reach a turf and a, a thing. They all disappear at the end, but they're all different. There's no one same wave. So life is always hitting us with different information all the time. And although it seems like it's another day, it's not another day. It is this day. Or in new age language, the day is today. <laughs> <laughs> like this type of thing. Where do you find meaning in life? Well... Everything is meaningful, but I would say meaning is hidden in love and compassion, in walking a righteous path of these things and offering support and this returning of grace that you have received to others. Everything is meaningful. Every moment is meaningful. Everything should be considered as a gift. Life is a beautiful gift and that's it. We should consider it as so, because otherwise we take it for granted and we lose this sense of being connected with it all. Where I am, sun shines usually, but in Sweden, well, sun doesn't shine. And the Swedish come here and they say, oh my God, this sun, these colors. And I'm saying, I've never observed that. This is how life passes. You're in the best place you can be, in the best conditions, and you should consider that you are in the best place and in the best conditions. 
and you do not observe it. You do not see it. You do not experience it. So the idea is leave it. Leave it and you will find meaning in all of it. Leave it with love, with your arms open, with compassion, and there is meaning. Offer to others and there is meaning. Uh, be honest and let's say with your heart open and there is meaning. What is love? We are love. In the end, we are love. In the end, love is everything. If you go to Paul in the New Testament, and he describes in his last chapter, he gives some good points about love. And yeah, even though he says, even though I can move mountains, if I don't have love, I have nothing. In the end, the only thing that remains is love. In Just in the previous verse line, he says, love can never be lost. I don't have it in English, but I have the Greek in my mind. So love can never be lost or misplaced or, or disappears, really. Because everything is made of love and we are made of love. It's like the fabric of the world. This is how everything is. Jumped. This is how everything works. So it is the thought, the fuel, the execution of the project. <laughs> everything is love. And it's interesting because at our highest peak of enjoying life, always we'll find love. When two people fall in love and come together, life is created. You see, it's what it's all about. And in the end, it will be only that. And it has been only that, in my mind, at least, in, in how I experience yeah, it. For me, also, it's the wholeness. One mistake that is very, very common is just that to understand it as an emotion. And emotions, they are changing all the time. It's the all emotions is... all together. It's all together now. <laughs> <laughs> I like this. The Beatles song. <laughs> uh, yeah, it is like this. But uh, you see, love has many aspects. Uh, even in some teachings in Hindu Tantra, they would say, you have the brotherly love, and then you have the lover's love, and then you have the love for God. There are really many different levels to this emotion, let's say. Uh, but uh, in all the, the, the truth, let's say, love could be the beginning and the end of it all. Because it's fueling everything. We all need to get love. We all need to experience love. We all need to see love. And we understand love as being life. And love is commitment. Love is support. Love is nurturing. In that sense, the mother holds the baby. And the baby really stays alive by her love. Because she has to give the breast and take the time. Sometimes I'm going to say it's really effort for the baby to eat and, and all that. It's only love that brings us to life. And love keeps us in life. And in love, we return. So yeah, that's it. And in terms of the emotions, it is what is fueling everything. We all need to receive love. We all need to feel that we're held and supported and safe. And these are all emotions that stem from love. There is the emotion that we feel every day, but there's also this idea of love. This supreme kind of umbrella of things. And what is faith? Faith has to do with truth. To really create this connection of believing and in contact with grace, if you are referring to that. Or it could be anything. It could be faith in the cause or faith in my process. It's kind of tricky, isn't it? What do you think that faith is? Something that I cannot explain, but I have the feeling that someone is after me. Then I'm not the, the most important thing in the universe. You know, there's something beyond me that is caring about me. Then I need to control everything. That there's much of my well-being, it will be take care. Sure. You see, we all have this idea, I think, because we've, we've been nurtured into life. Uh, I think it comes from our relationship with the mother in the beginning and our relationship in the womb to start with. The world will be supporting us always. That is holding us. It's keeping us. And this is like a, an underlying kind of, well, you can say programming, but it's an experience of that sense. Hopefully we have a healthy relationship in the womb. The mother is accepting the baby and everything is really held 
Everything is really supported. We do not need to do much. Everything is just right. Light and conditions and sounds. Everything is perfect. And then you come out of the womb. And of course, it's traumatic. And oh, my God. But then you have a mother holding you. And then really, again, you're thinking, hey, hmm, this thing kind of continues. And then once you grow, once you go into life, you have to guess if it's there. And at the end, you, you return to this being held by the love of God, by grace. Life is the in-between part where we're guessing of our support and the love that we keep receiving. And there, faith appears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How to build a healthy relationship with the divine. With something funny that I've been discussing this week with some friends about this relationship or talking about God. And I think something super, super common is that people just have a relationship as they need, as request. Let's say if they are in a struggling and they need God, they start talking and they start asking. And I was telling them, look, it's just like any kind of relationship. You're my friend. You never talk to me. And then when you call me, you're asking me something. This is not working, man. This is not how it, uh, how it goes. And it's just about, not about the receiving. It's about also like having this giving and receiving. Uh, it, it, maybe this idea is more suitable to the mechanics of, uh, of that. The truth is, like, remember the parable of Jesus. This young man takes the wealth of the father and... He goes, and the father says, eh, enjoy it. He slanders everything. He, he just spoils everything. You know? Everything is finished with women and wine. And then he wants to return home and says, will you accept me back? And the father says, come back, man. Come back right now. The house is open. No? And he returns, and it's not just I come in. I should take your old room or whatever. It's a feast. So... In terms of the mechanics, there is some truth, but in terms of our connection with grace or with God, if you like, I like to consider to consider this open arm and this party. So whenever a soul turns up and says father or mother or what is it uh, that they understand, there are a thousand years listening. <laughs> That's how I'd like to think about it. It doesn't matter if we are asking or what we're asking. These are the mechanics now, how we can build a better relationship. But the relationship is there. In a sense, what you're describing is that I have to understand better. So I have to build this understanding in me. But grace, it has no conditions. You belong to the family, and in the family you will return, and the gate is open, and whenever you come back, it's a day of joy. It's a day of rejoining, of feast, of coming again together in love. So, yes, we need to fix the mechanics, for sure, because fixing the mechanics fixes our, our understanding. Only asking is not the best way, let's say. And that's how it happens. Most times we approach, or people approach God in tough times, in difficult situations. And somebody might never believe in the existence of God. And there'll be a tough moment and say, oh, God, help me. Where is this coming from? <laughs> Who's saying that? <laughs> the point is that if it's coming from despair and not from authenticity and true love, when you're thirsty of God, you're thirsty of God, it doesn't depend on the need, anything specific. Of course, there's always grace. But I believe that then it's coming from not the right place. I don't know if it's blocking because it's always grace and, and you never know. That's, uh, maybe, maybe it worked. I was telling also my friends that for me, it's very important uh, to be grateful about the good things that I'm having in my life, but also be grateful for uncomfortable things that also I'm receiving because it's about being grateful for the experience itself. Because otherwise it's just in this behavior about, I want to get this, but not the other thing and not like this dualistic understanding of living. I think it's just about I'm grateful for the whole thing, you know. I agree. It's the best place to start. First, this is what you do in prayer. You offer thanks. You count your blessings, as they say. 
wow, I've been receiving all that and I'm maybe I still have good health or I haven't died yet or I can have love in my life and experience the food and the, what have you. It all starts from there. And then when you understand how blessed you are or how lucky you are to have this freedom of experiencing grace in this way, because imagine in the soul level, when it's not inside the body, there's not so much interaction with the world or grace. It's like a, a drop of water that is standing next to the river or that is inside the river. The drop is not really losing its shape. It's a crystal that is surrounding it. The individuality kind of remains, but it's in its element. The soul, when it's outside the body, it recognizes everything. It recognizes her path also and everything. But when it goes into the body, things start becoming tricky. Now you can freely interact with the world and you have to go with the mechanics of things. Now look at this. This is great, isn't it? If it was a soul, just a soul without a body would say, what you're showing me is me. Of course, I am great. But in this body, look at this. This is great, isn't it? Like winking. And you have to start receiving uh, and the process starts offering thanks and creating this relationship. Yeah, in that sense, it's like keeping a, a connection going like a normal relationship would be what you have been describing, like with a friend, you build on that and slowly you have a better understanding of the dynamic. And of course, the idea is that the more you focus on that, the more you grow, the more your understanding grows. But you have to also be able to listen. Because in prayer, for example, we go into this game of thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Or I need, I need, I need, I need, I need. And, and uh, please, 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 please. And it's always about me, 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 me. I'm thinking in heaven or in the, in the sky, there's kind of like offices that they deal with these type of people. That is like, I want this car, this new car, or please give me this, this or that. And, and there's like huge amount of work for these people that I want. And there is very little work for the people that say, please give to Javier this or heal this person or show him your love, reveal your support to that one or, or whatever. When we are praying for other people, when we are doing this, this work of relieving the pain or consciously bringing grace into other people's life then it's like whoa, whoa he's getting it he's getting it so please keep on pointing that way there are these things also in the right type of prayer you can say the way of praying but as i was saying we have to listen also because we pray and we ask and we never kind of stand and listen or see or wait we keep on going as we were, like the image of, of someone in their bed, uh, doing their prayers and going to bed. And then you wake up the next morning and you do the same stupid stuff. It needs to somehow evolve into something new. This process has to be transforming you. So I guess we transform through our prayer and through our connection with beauty, the world and grace. But we really know the world through our meditation through our this experience of listening to the world and seeing the world and being quiet for a while and staying in this space that is being held instead of only acting in that i guess also it's about enjoyment part of the relationship is okay i have this opportunity i have to use it i believe that i please god when I'm enjoying life. It's always about having fun, yes. Always. <laughs> Why is there a point? The only point is to share, really, this idea of a child with a lollipop that have been sucking on it and they give it to you. This is life. <laughs> <laughs> what is your main struggle right now in your spiritual journey? <laughs> Trying not to kill everyone. <laughs> it's no struggle. It's working with negativity. That's what we do. But it's part of the game. It, it never stops in that sense. We always 
are dealing with something, fixing something. So it's not so much a struggle. It's the name of the game. We touch negativity and we try to purify and we try to heal ourselves and our hearts in the process. One of the things, at least that I'm observing, although it's not so much on the personal, spiritual, or I don't know how you're describing, it seems that the planet, things are not going very well. So <laughs> the process has been changing lately. It's been kind of a need of finding what is best to offer and what is good for our reality in this moment. I'm finding that for people, it's harder to listen. It's harder to practice. It's harder to deal with more deeper stuff. We're kind of going in the surface of things. And one of my thoughts is, we have all this wealth, this spiritual wealth in from psychotherapy in the West, spiritual traditions of the East, and we're not using it. You have the matches and you have the wood and you have the fireplace and nobody's striking the match. Is what I'm feeling that is happening in our time. We are all saying we should light a fire to get warm. And we're looking at each other or we're thinking, oh, too bad, it's cold. So in my understanding, we need to be more active and we need to address the issues for people who are in this area of helping others and spirituality and so on, but also with meaningful things. And one of the things that I always am trying to not do is what already is being offered. Like, for example, he's offering a, a chakra meditation. That's good. So somebody is doing it. So it's okay. Are they doing it well? Should I also offer it so that it's been done and in the proper way? Maybe yes and maybe no. But uh, in that sense, we need to broaden this spectrum, the method or the tools of solution. We need to reinvent some of the things that we are already have in the toolbox. So this is one of the issues that really is making me think. I'm in this process of trying to adapt and always speaking with teachers and getting ideas and things like that. But as Ernest Hemingway puts it, may you live in interesting times. And these are interesting times. No sure. need to worry, it's happening. <laughs> for good or for worse, it's happening. Always when it's movement, there's always going to be negativity. Always going to be a lot of light too. So my goal is keep on going in that sense. <laughs> They say lights need some darkness to get bright, to show the light. The Indian cultures, they have a wheel moving from one expansion and contraction of movements. It's about movement itself. Sure. It's all about this pulsation in the world. We say that this pulsation in Tantra, for example, we say that this is the heart of Shiva beating, the heart of the creator. All it boom, boom, and this is the pulsation appearing and disappearing of the world. The light is like having this boom and going in and going in and going in, pulsating into the world. And life keeps on going. But there's also this, let's say, this uh, this undergoing security of this pulsation. Even if we're just contracting and expanding, there's a general expansion at the end of it. It's sometimes when you're in a contraction to believe that there's still expansion, there's necessarily, there can't be another way. It's like we were talking earlier with the body and therapy. The body contracts, but it needs to also expand. It's imperative that this happens. Otherwise, life cannot continue. And imagine, like, you hold your breath. How much can you hold it? You have to exhale. We say un, un mesa and vi mesa, the, uh, the pulsation, the appearing and reappearing, the spanda of the world in these traditions. One may say it's this continuation of grace in our world, of the light of grace penetrating and always kind of feeding the world somehow. And it's always expanding and expanding. Uh, the whole idea is catching the beginning uh, or returning to the beginning or the first light, the Bereshit kind of element. There is a point where it all begins. Uh, this is what in other traditions we say it's our true nature. Once you reach to this point of who we really are, then you can see the light appearing. What is personal power for you? How do you understand it? <laughs> he was asking the person who was asking him the questions. If I think about it, probably it's more connected with compassion, with being able to listen to others. I think as a general view, I think personal power is connected with money, with how can I control others. 
And I believe that there's like a lot of wrongness on that. I think personal power, it's been able to allow all the feelings that they are coming without any resistance. It's been able to connect with others without fear. Power in that sense has to go with two kind of balancing factors. One, there has to be a lot of compassion. And the other is being humble, humbleness. So both come with a knowledge of our being, I believe. So you're humble not because you have power or because you would like to have power. You're humble because you know. You know your position in the world. I was lucky in my life to meet great teachers and I'm still meeting, well, not so often. <laughs> Actually, I haven't been meeting any important teachers since 15 years now. But this idea is that you'll find that when you speak with these beings, that they're like, they have a sense of humbleness that overpowers you. Being humble sometimes is like closing into a shell or feeling that you're drawn back. But they are so humble that it hits you in the head, you know, like what is happening here? What is happening here? You have this great shining person. And they're very relaxed and not needing to say anything about that or show it. One of our teachers, uh, Drukshan Rinpoche, at some point, we were in Ladakh and he was answering some questions in a group. And they would ask him, like, he's supposedly the reincarnation of one of the most important uh, meditators the planet has ever known, or also this planet has known. <laughs> and only being with him, you get it, that there's something going on with this one. And uh, there was this kind of normal question, it not, was not so analytical or specific, you would say. And he said, he responded, and it was not a group or that he wasn't in the mood, but you could feel that it was his sense of humbleness and honesty and true connection with his personal light, his true nature, let's say. When they asked him, they said, you know, I'm not the right person to answer this. I do not have this type of knowledge, but maybe you should ask some better teacher than myself. And you could see that he meant it. And it's one of the few teachers that I've met in my life that I would say that he's a real teacher. If it is to learn anything, you learn from him. Like with all humbleness, he said, that, I'm not good with this. I cannot answer that. And where he could have been doing important rituals or whatever, he took his bicycle and he was circling India by bike. The, his holiness. <laughs> and not attending meetings or spiritual talks, not giving initiations, just raising consciousness about the environment and how we should act. If that isn't humble, if that isn't the real true understanding of our condition, then what is it? Mm -hmm. So yes, humbleness and compassion. Uh, understanding that we all suffer in the same way and we have the same problems and then being humble in the sense of who am I? to administer any sort of power. All power comes from God and returns back to God. We are just the vessel of transferring it when God allows us to. So that's how we should take it. Mm -hmm. And also with all these type of things, power, energy, holding, hunting of power and power places, and I don't know, getting spiritual teachings and more and more and more, you will realize if you're doing that, or at least I was doing that for many years and I, came to this that you can never hold it all you can never learn it all and it's okay uh, it's fine it will not be what will lead you to your realization your realization is with you and you just need to fool around until your ego gets kind of tricked and then you shine <laughs> <laughs> i guess it's simple all these spiritual techniques end up to just be present like Norbu was saying, just be present. Like there is this uh, moment in his documentary that they're taking him to his car and the alarm of the car is going, beep, beep, beep. and Norbu says, the car is saying, be present. <laughs> like an alarm in your head. Be present, man, we're going down. And that's what it is. It's not about power. It's about being present at the end of the day. And it's the first and last instruction you'll ever receive. Hmm. The last one. Can you tell us about some amazing memories from your spiritual journey? 
One thing that I would say in this path is kind of the, the timing of things. So this always amazes me. Uh, this always kind of uh, moves me. Oh my God, what has happened here? Why is this happening? I'll tell you this. We were once in Varanasi and uh, it's monsoon time. So all Varanasi is flooded, like really flooded. You have to walk into half a meter of Ganges everywhere. <laughs> so you imagine the Ganges is not the cleanest river. It's this type of thing, you know. But I remember I was so happy being there that I was saying, Shiva is blessing everything. Oh my God, this Shiva's overflowing grace. And I was tripping, man. I was like a hippie. So in this process. But I'm mentioning this more because you have to be in tune with things for them to come in real unison and click. So I was in Varanasi. It was raining like hell. One half a meter of water everywhere, house is flooding. And I was like, oh my God, what is this? This is beauty. This is Shiva blessing everyone. And in older times, it would have been. <laughs> but now it's just a mess. This is for your spiritual thought. And I remember I wanted to visit the Vishwanath temple, the, the main Shiva temple. I wanted to observe an arti, an offering to the Lingam, because it's one of the 12 most important Lingams in India is in, in Varanasi. And there were no places to visit because it's a kind of a VIP thing, this art, this offering to the lingam, to the palace of Shiva. And I remember going into a shop and I was seeing the lingams and I was getting some for some people who have asked me and they were good quality and expensive ones also. The guy said, are you buying Shiva lingams? Are you aware and all that? And I said, yeah, yeah. And then we just start chatting and I said, I cannot get access to the art. And he says... What are you talking about? My friend is the temple master. He's the one who takes care of everything. So no problem. You want two seats? Yeah, two seats. So you want the front seat? The closer you sit to the puja, the, the more expensive. And I remember we were being there with one of the ministers of the Indian government that night. So it's kind of this type of thing. He said, I will give you a good seat and with a normal ticket, he says. So perfect. We find our place. We go and it's this, I remember entering the temple and we're the first to enter. And the pujari, the, the main teacher or the person who's doing the offerings, says, oh, come here, come here. So he gives me a big basket of all the offerings to the lingam on the previous puja. This is like, imagine somebody hands you a nuclear bomb that is ticking of energy, you know, of blessing. So he says, you come here. And at that time I had long rasta and... Who knows, maybe the hair kind of caught his eye, you know, it's said this one. But he gives me this huge basket <laughs> of these blessings and he says, take this and bring it to that place. I'm just there to observe the puja. I'm not working for the temple, but I'm holding this thing. The minute I held it, I'm thinking, oh my God is happening why am i holding this where am i kind of you know so i'm receiving this first thing and bring it to another place and then it was still trying to understand what has happened and then we take our seats at the back but then again this pujari says no, no no you don't don't sit at the back come to the front so he brings us right next the lingam is there you know the vishwanath lingam is there and we're like with my partner we're like oh my god this is i hope they don't charge us extra for all of that and it keeps on going like this for example the ritual starts and a little mouse jumps from somewhere and crosses our path and in tantra it's like ganesha appearing and Oh my God, it's like every, everything was happening at the right time. And we go through this wonderful puja and who knows what was happening that night is one, one of Shiva's blessings. And of course, it doesn't come just because we went to Kasi. It's because of many things, practice and mainly teachers, connection with teachers. So we get there and they're doing the offerings to the lingam and then they have to clear it. And these offerings usually go into baskets, but they bring us and they give us the offerings that were on the lingam like huge garlands of flowers and things like that they don't give them to people or they gave one to the minister <laughs> and they gave one to us that we were just visiting and then the ritual stops finishes and then you get a chance if you have registered for it <laughs> to with the pujari to go through the, all the offerings to the lingam so they have all the precious things that you put and they give you and you get this blessing of offering no? So the pujari says, you people wait, and they wait, and he says, you come, and we go in front of the minister, and now we are the first ones who are doing puja. For some reason, we haven't reserved our place, we haven't done anything, so 
Here we are. We are at the Shiva Lingam in, in the Holy Holies. And we are finishing, because for me, it was like a kind of finishing of practice or one step of my practice was having something. And I thought I should bring my body also <laughs> close to one of these places. And then it just keeps on going and going. It gets even more personal and personal than that. I'll save that for chats when we're in the seminars, but it's like the the timing of things just clicking and clicking and clicking. Like once I was in India, I was in a temple in the mountains, like 4,000 meters next to a glacier. And I went for my practice there for some time. And I wanted to visit the places next to this. But it, you know, it's the Himalayas and you cannot just follow a path or a road. Like one place is here, the other place is here, but you have to go down, around. And this is like a three-day journey, for example. And I'm there and I'm doing my thing. And I meet this lady that is really rich. In, I was walking. <laughs> I was walking. And I meet this lady from Karnataka and she's rich and says, I see you and what are you doing here? I'm just doing a little bit of practice. I'm just visiting. And says, hey, would you like to join us? I'm doing a sacred travel to all these places. Looking at my list, oh, this is the places I want to visit. <laughs> I say, don't worry, you don't. We don't need any money. You just come with us. Come and enjoy with us. I will pay for everything. So they take me on a journey, <laughs> going to the place I want to visit with a nice Land Rover, big, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and with a driver and food and uh, bottled water. <laughs> And it's one of these things, I mean, most is this synchronicity that I can be going and going on with things like that, but it's the synchronicity and the, the, the how generous the spiritual path really rewards you if you're listening and if you are catching the things. You could have said, oh, don't take tickets from that guy because who knows? It might be weird or anything. And nothing of that would have happened, you see. The divine synchronicity for me is what always gets me. <laughs> I can never have enough of that. It's not so much the spiritual things, but how it kind of clicks in place. It, everything is like supporting everything. And you just need to have this clear, I would say desire. Yeah, why not? This clear desire where you're going. And then with a heart innocent and open, and things just happen. Things just happen. So suffering, there's no suffering. There shouldn't be any suffering because you're listening. He was, was asking me, we're doing some videos for meditation to promote a course that we're doing, training teachers. And we go to this beautiful place up in the mountain, and there's a gorge and the sea underneath, and we're supposed to do an interview at that place. <laughs> and the question is, what is meditation? And I'm, man, this is it. This is meditation. It's just listen. Just learn to listen. Just <laughs> At that moment, clouds kind of unravel in front of us. And the sun, and it's like, oh, my God, this was it. You have to listen. So let's listen. Let's receive the world as it's speaking to us and make good use of that by being just present and receiving with this gratitude and give back with gratitude. And it happens. And mm -hmm. we heal this way. And of course, sometimes the path is not so comfortable, but it's like the bosses in India, you know, they're not comfortable, but they really take you places. I mean... Now I travel by plane, <laughs> if I'm in India, or by private car. It's the motivation. You have the right motivation and your, your decisions, they are based on love, not in fear. I was actually yesterday or, or a few days ago, I was making a question that still I have to answer. What choices would I take if I wouldn't have fear? I think fear is one of the main blockers. Yeah. And it's also protecting life at the same time. It's a tricky one, fear. For sure, to walk into this world and to enjoy life and to enjoy ourselves and being free of all the disturbing negativities and emotions and limitations. Uh, fear is one of the main ones that you need to address because most of our choices we do, we take in fear. It's kind of guiding the experience from above and it's, uh, it's a difficult one.
to handle really. And then imagine if you were just open and ready to explore. It's what I was saying earlier. You go into conditions and you think, oh, maybe something will happen or oh, maybe they charge us more or maybe they, they kill us and drop our bodies in the lake or whatever. And you're creating that reality for by sure. thinking. For sure, for sure. Fear, because it has this strong protective layer in our uh, limiting our energy. It also manifests very quickly, hmm. and its action is limitation. Fear's action is limitation. It's appearing like a fence or not moving past that point. And if you're also putting fences everywhere, then you'll yeah. be just standing in your same spot. A few weeks ago, I was having a podcast with a friend of mine who's from India. He's a Sith. And I asked him what it was the most important thing in his life right now. And he said he was believing that fear is an illusion and he had this intuition. So the most important thing is just trying to wake up from the illusion of fear. And I felt like, fuck. I would also add to that, go to the edge of a cliff and just look down and you'll see how real fear is. Even if you're not afraid of heights, your stomach will bounce to your palate and return <laughs> for a moment. <laughs> and that's fear. That's fear. Fear is this action of protecting life. Mm -hmm. And it's all good. It's all good. But when we bring it in fear of the unknown, in this unsure of the unknown, then it's really limiting. It's creating a fence into our experience. So it's like a sheep that you fence it and then that's it. What can you do? Just stay here, eat the grass, have some drinks a little bit of sex and wait, death will come. <laughs> Good. So you're coming over pretty soon to Canary Islands and yeah, you're going to make a process in here. Four and five of February, the first weekend of February. So we'll be starting this program, this approach. We, we, we say it free flow or flujo libre. They've translated it in Spanish. There's a whole idea of getting to know the flow of our bodies better. Dealing a little bit with our emotions, learning to express more freely, uniting these three flows of mind, body, and emotions, and doing this reconnection in our lives. And of course, if the opportunity is given in the future, we'll be dealing on this same issue with many different techniques, schools, some spiritual things, but mainly into this restoring of our experience in this free flow and in this understanding that there are no limitations other than the ones that we like to accept or we like to keep in our lives. We can always keep on growing and becoming better and learning and releasing from the fears and the traumas of the past. And it can get better and better every time. And also this idea of uh, this journey that what I was saying earlier, you want to explore, you want to go into the woods and explore a little bit, like a kid is saying to the next one. And this is what I'm suggesting with this program. You want to explore a little bit? <laughs> come, come. <laughs> so if you want to explore, you're welcome. There's no need to be spiritual or to have deep knowledge of therapy or anything like that. Yeah, I remember yesterday I was talking to a friend also. She was saying that she was afraid to kind of doing a therapy. I told her, look, a very good sign that is something that it will make you a big transformation is something that you need is that it should scare you. You should have like the first impression. No, I don't want to do it. I'm like this. I'm looking forward to you to coming here, but I'm also scared, you know, like, because I know that it's going to be at the ball. So it's just a good sign. Like it makes me feel uncomfortable. It's a good sign that it will be helpful. But also think of the woods. There are many dangers there, but the exploration effect is so great and who knows what's after the forest <laughs> what's after the woods so yeah, it's a process where really we learn slowly it's not rushing anybody on the personal level because when we do our personal therapy it's more direct more focused on what we are who we are it's Javier and we see the limitations and we address what you are ready to address and it's the same there even easier because in the group you don't need to Give any explanations. So I don't want to participate. So fuck off the rest of you. <laughs> I, I don't want to say anything right now. That's fine. That's no problem. Hmm. Uh, so it, anyway, it will be a gradual, gradual process. And every time 
we will have kind of a good support, I believe, once the group is formed, a good support even once or twice every month online, discussing and seeing how we apply the techniques and so on. We'll be walking this path together. Hopefully it can continue because it's a beautiful process. In Greece, we've been teaching this for about eight years now. In other places, it's been very success successful and really helpful for me. I keep on learning many things through applying the techniques. So. And also you have this group process. There's always said no, that, that there's more energy and like speed up the process somehow. This is the gift of groups because in the personal process, You're there, you're alone, you're expressing, okay, but there is a kind of lack of a stimulant. While you're in the group, somebody's saying something and it's affecting you, somebody is crying maybe, and now you're feeling also the need or something is triggering inside of you. And before you know, it, you're going, you're really into it. So the dynamic of the group is great. The more different people you have in the group, because one thing we see is that mainly women are interested in improving themselves. And this should scare us. <laughs> If only one part of our, uh, our planet is interested in becoming better, then what about the others, you know? If there's a nice, let's say, balance of men and women, and if it's a nice balance of cultures also, it's wonderful because everybody comes with their own thing and then we can bounce on each other all these beautiful realizations. For me, as I was saying, I keep on learning and it never stops to amaze me. The, how things work in group. That's why I keep on working in groups and I like more because the personal thing is effective, but it's boring. <laughs> but the group is always like, oh man, look at what's happening, you know? It always has this. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to see you here. And, and anyone who is interested. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for the talk, yeah. See you soon. Have a nice one. Ciao, ciao. Bye.